Das geteilte Deutschland im Jahre The divided Germany in 1989. So two countries was something that many, particularly in France and Great Britain, thought should stay that way. Schön, dass es davon zwei gibt. The French ambassador told me this coal, this reunification, he wants to make a single state. That's crazy. We always thought that France and Germany together in the same bed, trouble, yeah? Trouble for the British. Germany was a revanchist country in the eyes of all the Soviet people back then. There they were all revanchists who were only trying to swallow up East Germany. East Germany was my country. Germany is a united fatherland. I grew up at a time when that wasn't conceivable at all. To suddenly give people freedom is huge. And that's what happened. Germany in 1989, a divided country. If it were ever to be reunited, it would need the consent of the four victorious powers of World War II. The Soviet Union, the US, Britain and France had so-called reserved rights. In the autumn of 1989, the peaceful revolution sweeping across the Eastern Bloc had also reached East Germany. But the communist regime ignored the people's voice. Instead of reforms, it staged the largest military parade ever. Still, demonstrations and a mass exodus of its citizens put the regime under enormous pressure. Finally, it was forced to open its borders to the West. I left my East German translator uh, to follow the rest of the press conference. And Shabovsky said, yes, the wall is now open, or worse to that effect. I Privatreisen nach dem Ausland können ohne Vorliegen Von Voraussetzungen, Reiseanlässe und Verwandtschaftsverhältnisse beantragt werden. And my translator, who had never been to the West, was one of the first ones through, Victor Homola. And he rushed through and started begging the people he met to give him a lift to my hotel. He had no idea where the hotel is. And suddenly he's banging on my door, but I'm in the middle of writing a story. I don't know what's happened. And he bursts in, and I say, Victor, Listen, I'm writing a story. Take something from the minibar and I'll talk to you in a minute. And then suddenly I think, Victor Homola is here in West Berlin. He's not allowed to be here. He's, he's an East German. Victor, what are you doing here? And he finally says, that's what I'm trying to tell you. The wall is down. I was in Bonn and experienced the fall of the Berlin Wall in the Bundestag when the deputies stood up and sang the German national anthem. And I have to say it was heartrending. Only the West German Chancellor was absent on this historic day. Helmut Kohl had just landed in Warsaw for an inaugural visit to the first non-communist government in the Soviet bloc. This trip to Poland was to have been a great celebration of reconciliation between this new first free government in Poland and the former West Germany, led by Helmut Kohl. So of course we were all there and thought, well, now for the big dinner. It was the evening of November 9th, and I was sitting in my hotel when the news suddenly broke live on television. The wall is open. I almost fell off the bed. It was quite clear. Helmut Kohl was surprisingly quiet and thoughtful. He didn't break out into obvious euphoria, but you could tell he was asking himself, what should I do now? Faced with a delicate situation, Kohl remained diplomatic. Berlin, November the 10th, 1989. Overnight, the city moved into the spotlight of history. 
So, in a British Army helicopter, which I borrowed, I flew uh, 33 hours later to Berlin and landed beside the wall on the western side. It was very cold, very early in the morning. And the best thing about that scene was that the British Army in Berlin had set up a free tea stand just this side of the wall. So the first experience of freedom that a lot of people got coming through was British Army tea, which is very strong and very hot and very sweet. The first thing Helmut Kohl did after his return from Warsaw was to talk to all the major partners. He talked on the phone to President Bush, to Mitterrand, to Margaret Thatcher and to General Secretary Gorbachev. Basically, what came out of these phone calls was that everyone said we have to prevent chaos from breaking out. The whole process must be kept under control. After the wall fell, there were calls for Soviet troops to intervene immediately. But the man who decided everything was General Secretary Gorbachev. Gorbachev wanted no violence and sent a messenger to Bonn. It was a real surprise for the Chancellor's office. An immediate trigger was a Soviet visitor to my office, a journalist, Mr. Portugalov, whom we later learned was a KGB general. We had always suspected that, but we didn't know it until later. He had been sent to me with a list of questions, and these questions all revolved in principle around the subject of German unification. I was really electrified because I thought, Portugalov always represents the dogmatic Soviet party line. And now here he is, suddenly talking about German unification. If he dares to do that, I told the Chancellor, then it's high time that he publicly took the lead. Three weeks after the fall of the wall, Kohl's advisor, Horst Telchik, called me in my office. That was unique. I did not expect that, and said the Chancellor was due to make an important statement, and they wanted to invite us. Die künftige Architektur Deutschlands muss sich einfügen in die künftige Architektur Gesamteuropas. Helmut Kohl was planning German reunification, a plan to which his foreign minister was not privy. The ten points in the plan for German-German rapprochement were de facto steps towards reunification. On November 25th, Herr Kohl made his statement and agrees with me as Prime Minister of East Germany that we needed to be bound by a treaty. Although we didn't rightly know what being bound by a treaty meant, I said we'd think of something. We wanted to reduce the resistance of East Germany and the Soviet Union by accepting their proposals. The Ten Point Speech did shock all of us because we had so-called reserve rights about what would be the solution to the German question. And Kohl had adopted unification without consulting the other the other countries which had to agree to that. We knew right from the start that Margaret Thatcher would be against it, so we didn't tell her. After the ten-point plan was announced, of course the reaction in Paris was mild horror. We only found out about it from the press, even though we worked very closely together and spoke on the phone every day with the staff at the West German Chancellery. The French ambassador told me, this coal, this reunification, he wants to make a single state, and that's crazy. No consultation, and so on. Come to my office in Bonn on Monday, and I'll explain to you how things should happen. 
I didn't go. Of course not. Because I knew Cole was right. He had seized a moment in history when it was necessary. President Bush had the speech about an hour and a half before Cole made it. But it was in German, so he couldn't read it in advance. The danger was that he could otherwise have called to Helmut and said, Helmut, great speech. You know I support you, but let's talk beforehand. There were a lot of anxieties among countries in the West. There were anxieties in countries in the East about what would happen? Would you have a new Mittel Europa? So the notion of a united NATO was to, uh, uh, a Germany in NATO, was partly to preserve the stability that we've had for the past 25 or 30 years. The Soviets, the Soviets had a problem with exactly that. For them, NATO was an opposing military alliance, and in the beginning, they couldn't imagine it. Moscow was disgruntled. Soviet correspondent Vladimir Kondratyev explained why in German TV's press club show. The Russians were also preoccupied with their own problems. After the collapse of the Soviet bloc, the country was suffering a major supply crisis. People began to hoard stocks like in wartime. Of course, this caused a lot of discontent, and against this background, purely foreign policy issues such as the reunification of Germany went almost unnoticed by the majority. I remember very clearly December 18. Cole flew to Dresden, and I was with him. And he arrived in the city, and people, huge crowd of people, huge, were just yelling, Ein Heit, Ein Heit. There was this chant. And Cole later said that that was the moment he realized that you can't delay it. Modro eröffnet. Like all secretaries general of the Warsaw Pact, Modrow started off with a boring written statement about peace, détente, disarmament, and so on. He didn't give us the feeling that he knew what the situation in his country was really like. The talks with Helmut Kohl weren't about the issues of unification at that point. They were just about the joint treaty. Kohl wasn't willing to negotiate with me any further. What Helmut Kohl was expecting from Herr Modrow was a clear reform program. But the only reform program he had was that he wanted 15 billion, and later gave us a list of everything he wanted to buy in West Germany to supply the East Germans. Well, that couldn't be the answer. Das konnte nicht die Antwort sein. An important moment came on the 22nd of December 1989, when East Germany officially opened the Berlin Wall and Helmut Kohl and Prime Minister Modro walked together through the Brandenburg Gate. I actually was supposed to take part in the live broadcast from the other side of the Brandenburg Gate for ARD. A microphone had been set up for me, but I couldn't get to it because of the crowds pouring through. I was 50 centimeters from the microphone, but it went on and on, and then we all went pouring through the Brandenburg Gate together. 
and here you see it again, the immense crowd, euphoric and full of commitment. And it really felt like a historic moment. The Western European allies, France and England, were more than skeptical. They were actually against it at the beginning. They made no secret of it. Margaret Thatcher, I believe if it had been up to her, there would certainly have been no German reunification. Margaret Thatcher was a child of the 1930s. She'd grown up um, with the rise of Nazism. Um, her family had hosted um, Jewish refugees from Germany. So she had that knowledge of what had happened. And her lesson that she drew from that process was that Germany was too big and too aggressive if left as a single large state in the middle of Europe. And she did not believe that the German character had fundamentally changed. It is true that Mrs. Thatcher occasionally had a map of, of uh, Europe in the past showing the size of Germany at different moments in history in her famous handbag. And I think there was some meeting with President Mitterrand when she produced the map. But that's an incident. Margaret Thatcher said to François Mitterrand, Margaret Thatcher said to François Mitterrand, during my summer holidays, I reread Churchill's war memoirs. Aren't you afraid? Mitterrand had been talking about a common European currency. Are you not afraid of being swallowed up by Germany? And Mitterrand said, no, madame, the economy is not crucial. World politics is. We think that Mitterrand played a double game. Yeah, he, he pretended uh, when he talked to Thatcher, he pretended that he was 100% against unification. When he talked to Gorbachev, he tried to get Gorbachev to stop unification. But when he talked publicly, and when he talked to Helmut Kohl, then it was all, you know, hand in hand uh, and uh, very touching stories. Actually, Mitterrand and Kohl were in agreement from early on. Paris was to give reunification the green light if Kohl allowed Europe a bigger role. The Chancellor was even willing to give up the Deutschmark. The British were left in the dark. This was the price that had to be paid to France. European currency, European army, European foreign policy, you know, Eurovision. <laughs> I mean, just everything, you know? Um, uh, and we were really worried about this. We didn't, you know, because we don't want that kind of Europe. Uh, we want a different kind of Europe, um, and Helmut Kohl wasn't going to give us a choice. So German unification mean that, meant that we had less choice. When Mrs. Thatcher was in Moscow and the conversation turned to reunification, she asked that no stenographic record be kept. But of course, after that, everything was recorded. In the interview, she clearly said, we believe it is very dangerous and that the Germans are trying to establish hegemony. She was of the opinion that the Soviet Union should take a stronger position against reunification. Gorbachev is suspicious. He thinks he's being set up to be the fall guy. And frankly, Gorbachev thinks, hmm, of these people, will I choose France and Britain or will I choose the United States and Germany? And he thinks the latter two are probably the safer course. Bush and Baker were very understanding towards Gorbachev. They didn't do what used to occur during the Cold War. Instead, they welcomed his reforms. They said there would be new opportunities for Russia and the Soviet Union. Nobody at the time ever imagined that the USSR itself would collapse within two years. A special summit in Ottawa. NATO and the Warsaw Pact met, and German reunification became the major topic of an international conference for the first time.
we had to think of a mechanism that would allow us to deal with four power rights, deal with the issues of, of internal to German unification, but also some of these other topics. And so we uh, worked with a team and came up with this idea of two plus four. We emphasized two before the four because we wanted to stress that the unification of the Germanies would be the leading part. And uh, I remember when uh, Baker went around to try to advance this idea with the Brits and the French and others, some would say, oh, four plus two, some would use six. Uh, there was some resistance of this. And I remember it, uh, it was quite an important moment when we finally got the full acceptance of this of the Soviet Union at a meeting in Ottawa. So the two plus four format was born. But nobody knew what Moscow's stance would be. That's why the East and West German governments wanted to talk to Gorbachev as soon as possible. Each had its own plans for German-German rapprochement. When Hans Modrow came back from Moscow and talked about a united German fatherland, I was very angry. He, of all people, is now trying to persuade us that we were heading towards reunification. Before his trip to Moscow, it had all sounded quite different. But whilst Mordor was still talking about a step-by-step -step process of reunification, the West German Chancellor was in a hurry. The DDR was buchstäblich bankrupt. East Germany was literally bankrupt. Who would help them then if we didn't? That would also have been the main message to Gorbachev in case he asked Helmut Kohl to explain why he wanted German unification. But it never got that far because 20 minutes into his statement, Gorbachev completely surprised us. He agreed to our reunification. Gorbachev had me unmissverständlich zugesagt, that the Soviet Union the decision of the Germans to live in one state to respect it. And that the decision of the Germans is the time and the way to decide the unification. It couldn't have been any better. The great Soviet Union, still represented by hundreds of thousands of soldiers in East Germany, agreed that Germany could become one again. So it was no surprise that this mood, these moments of strong emotion, emerged in the aircraft, where seasoned politicians raised their glasses and didn't just clink glasses for the cameras. Germany had friends in the West, and these friends had to recognize German unification, otherwise they'd no longer be friends and allies. It was clear to Margaret Thatcher, as to all of us, after the famous meeting between Kohl and Gorbachev, that unification had been inevitable. It may have been a setback for Margaret Thatcher, but the diplomats were relieved. Just how problematic the British Foreign Office found its Prime Minister's opposition only became clear almost two decades later. This is a telegram from Sir Christopher Malaby in Bonn, and he says, despite our supportive line on the German wish to achieve unity through self-determination, the UK is perceived here as perhaps the least positive of the three Western allies and the least important. And in the margin, you can see Mrs. Thatcher's writing, because we are. I think I wouldn't say we wanted to change the image. I think we wanted to give all the documents that were relevant in order to allow people to form their own opinion, really. And I think what had happened was that the opinion of British policy had been based very, very strongly, really, on Mrs. Thatcher's own memoirs. And that became the do dominant narrative, really. Because of the remarks that Mrs. Thatcher had made earlier, publicly it looked as though we'd been against unification. Privately, in the negotiation, Douglas Heard, the British Foreign Secretary, was um, negotiating very, very helpfully, making some of the best suggestions that were made to get agreement with the Soviet Union. Even before the formal negotiations began, East Germans took part in a free election for the first time. A new government was to represent them. 
Helmut Kohl campaigned vigorously. Und ich sage Ihnen, diese Unterstützung wird kommen, weil wir gemeinsam ein blühendes Land aufbauen wollen. Stellen sich Helmut Kohl vor auf den Plätzen der Städte. Imagine Helmut Kohl in the squares of the cities. Up to 250,000 GDR citizens on the square. He had never experienced such a thing in West Germany in his life. Of course, that inspired him. When a quarter of a million people cheer for you, then of course you're going to say, I am the greatest. Da können Sie nur sagen, ich bin der Größte. There was a certainty that a fundamental decision was being taken, that it was not about saying, and another four years, and another 99%, but that a fundamental choice of direction was being made for this country. And that is just what it was. So we had free elections, an elected government, an elected parliament with a mandate, and the clear desire to organize German reunification. And that's exactly what happened. The agreements were negotiated under pressure from East German citizens who wanted things to move quickly. I always had the feeling Modro was trying to salvage something from East Germany, that he had no chance, and de Maizière just saw himself as responsible for an orderly handover. The people in East Germany stood against their own regime with the cry, we are the people, which soon became, we are one people. This was a clear call for unification. To say that West Germany pounced on its neighbor and swallowed it up is wrong. The majority of East Germans clearly decided that they wanted to join the Federal Republic. Federal press conferences took place regularly here in the aquarium, and Helmut Kohl attended them twice a year. He addressed topical issues that were being discussed and talked about the unification of Germany. And of course, he made the classic remarks about blossoming landscapes and that German reunification could be paid out of petty cash. And we reported it all. It was important for the people back home. I also wasn't one of those who believed all that. The thing about petty cash, for example, but it wasn't meant for me anyway. It was intended to reassure the West German taxpayer. There were enormous financial transfers from West to East, and the people in the old Federal Republic did not get up in arms about it. They might not have been thrilled about it, but they accepted it. And they knew in their hearts that it was necessary, even if they didn't like it. Spring saw further developments in the international arena. The Europeans agreed to unification and declared that the new Germany would be part of the European community. Then the 2 plus 4 negotiations started. Four meetings were scheduled to hammer out the details. The Germans had two foreign ministers at the talks. Markus Mecker for East Germany, and Hans-Dietrich Genscher for the West. There was the question of the future status of a united Germany. Firstly, would we get full sovereignty back from the four victorious powers or not? Second, would a unified Germany be a member of NATO? And if so, in what form? Then the withdrawal of the Soviet forces, 370,000 Soviet troops in East Germany. Gorbachev was worried that Kohl was putting his foot on the accelerator, sort of destabilizing. And the fact that Bush developed a trusting relationship with Gorbachev, including at that, uh, that Malta meeting, I think gave some support as Kohl did what he had to do to sort of take advantage of this moment in, in history. I think Cole, in that sense, was, just knew that there has to be a price, that there has to be a give and take. He's asking Gorbachev to do an amazingly courageous thing, uh, historically, to cede 
you know, what they saw as their empire. And so it did come with, but that was not the key. The key was, you know, first you agree it's going to happen, and now let's figure out how we can make it palatable. And let the Russians pull out without humiliation. That was what was left. By then, Gorbachev was ready to let these countries uh, become united. In the meantime, the economic situation in the Soviet Union had become critical. Bonn offered to help with a treaty. In exchange for the withdrawal of Soviet forces, the German government would pay almost four billion Deutschmarks and indicated its willingness to provide even bigger loans. The Soviet Union was the Soviet Union, a world power, would have been insolvent by the end of June 1990. Helmut Kohl ordered me to go to Moscow with the heads of two major German banks, a secret journey to negotiate everything. And the clear message I got from Gorbachev was, we want this agreement and we want this loan. I had to explain to him that we were prepared to do this but it was part of an overall solution. Above all, an overall solution involved the issue of a united Germany's alliances. It was the main theme during Gorbachev's visit to the US in the summer. Gorbachev was very enamored with the CSE principles. And I recalled that one of the principles of the CSEE was that each country is free to join their own alliance. So President Bush says to Gorbachev in the cabinet room, um, you know, uh, Mikhail, uh, can you agree that under CSE principles that we won't say Germany will join NATO, we'll say that Germany is free to make its own choice under CSE principles and that if it chooses NATO that we will accept it. And Gorbachev says, yes, I can accept that. So that was the moment that we had Gorbachev accepting uh, the notion of a united Germany and NATO. We had to make concessions, but there was one condition. If a united Germany became a NATO member, there would be no NATO bases on the territory of the former East Germany. Reality shows that whilst there can be a lot of goodwill and fine words in politics, you can unfortunately only believe in a document. Damit erhält das geeinte Deutschland zum Zeitpunkt seiner Vereinigung seine volle und uneingeschränkte Souveränität. The commitment to German unity, NATO membership, a return of full sovereignty, and, and, and. I think that in the end he agreed to the whole development because he hoped that this great united Germany, economically powerful, technologically strong, would be the most important partner for him for the modernization and development of the Soviet Union. Expectations were really high. It was believed at the time that Russia and Germany were entering a new era and everything would evolve very nicely. And no one at that time could imagine Russia would face great difficulties. If Gorbachev had said at the talks in Moscow in the beginning of February, Herr Chancellor, you can have East Germany and I'll give it to you, and it'll cost you a hundred billion, would we have said no? No. So to that extent, what we ultimately financed was relative, especially since a large proportion was also made up of loans. By late summer 1990, only one problem was left to solve, the Oder Neisse Line. Poland had been waiting since the end of World War II for West Germany to recognize the border along the two rivers. Both East Germany and the four victorious powers supported Poland's position. It was decided to resolve the matter at the 2 plus 4 summit in Paris, 
which the Polish foreign minister was invited to attend. Tadeusz Mazowiecki's new government was coming under enormous pressure over the border question, and every day's delay just undermined it further. The government needed the trust and credibility of its population. It was about a Polish existential question, its western border. And that was at a time when the first democratic government had to embark on radical reforms. Remember, France had also got Alsace back from Germany, and this border was inviolable. So the Polish border should be inviolable too. It was like a balance. My proposal was for the two German states and Poland to draw up a border treaty, which would then be signed and ratified immediately after German unification. Kohl was totally against it. Helmut Kohl really dragged his heels on this, but it was of course very important. The Allies, all of them, the United States, England, France and the Soviet Union, had all made it a condition for German unification. This was not just a domestic issue for Kohl, and the Americans unequivocally intervened in Bonn and said, folks, if you don't do it, the deal is off. So, from the German point of view, the choice was unification with East Germany and Berlin, but with the final loss of former territories in Eastern Europe, or nothing. After four months of negotiations, but less than a year after the wall came down, the unification treaty was finalized. Two states, two societies and two armies were to become one country. A thousand pages regulated the accession of East Germany to the Federal Republic. The International 2 plus 4 Treaty was also signed in Moscow, the four victorious powers returning full sovereignty to a united Germany, 45 years after the end of the Second World War. There are some critics that say, oh, you should have spent more time trying to design a new European this or that or others. Well, good luck. I mean, you know, getting all this done in 11 months was hard enough. And frankly, doing it in a way that created a structure for a unified Germany in NATO, a changing European uh, Commission, uh, offering possibilities for the then Soviet Union, uh, and also possibilities for other Eastern European countries, to me, looked like a pretty good year's work. Everyone has their moment of glory, and my finest hour was to live and work in the Federal Republic at the time of reunification. I bought a case of beer and distributed the bottles among my friends, and we all drank to the health of the German people on camera. I drank to the fact that Germany had now achieved its goal, her dream had become a reality, and now the main thing was not to jeopardize these achievements, but to continue to develop. Everything we are experiencing now is to all intents and purposes a break with those former hopes. A lot has been achieved, but I think it will take just as long again until you no longer notice the difference. But I don't see it now with younger colleagues who are 25 or 26 when they start working for us. They are United Germans. Reunification is the greatest story that you can experience as a journalist. The Einheit is now 49 minutes old. 
And of course, we were delighted on a personal level. It was a huge story, and 25 years later, things look quite different. The old fears of a Berlin Republic, of German domination of Europe, those fears have simply evaporated. We now have a paradox um, because suddenly we've realized that we need Germany. We need this big reunified Germany under this powerful Angela Merkel because um, we need to change our relationship to Europe and we can only do that with the help of the Germans. So the Germans have become our best friends. Yeah. You had a quiet revolution, better than we French did. No heads rolled. I salute you. The Germans are necessary. Without them, you can't build Europe. But they should not be overestimated either. Don't overestimate their options. They are limited. Germany is too big for the others, but also too small for Europe. The Germans never really revealed the depth of what this meant to their identity to have this history of World War II and the Nazi past always hanging over them and to live with this uh, physical evidence of their historic shame. And so all of these things, and suddenly it comes together again. And it, it's a relief. It's, it's an affirmation that we can be one people again. Um, and, you know, to, to witness that was enormously powerful, to see what an end to your penance means, uh, which in effect it was.